The Canoe Show is brought to you in association with British Canoeing. Hello and welcome to The Canoe Show. Today we're looking at the rise and rise of stand-up paddleboarding and I'll be taking a trip up the River Hamble for our canoe trail. We'll also be looking at work to protect biodiversity in the Norfolk Broads and I'll be trying my hand at recreational freestyle. But first, it's been impossible to miss the arrival of stand-up paddleboarding on the scene. It's a form of paddle sport that really gets a heated discussion going among canoeists and yet it is a really attractive and unthreatening way into paddling for a lot of people so we thought we should investigate further. Stand-up paddleboarding started out mainly as a beach activity, but increasingly paddlers are taking to inland waterways and British Canoeing has secured new inland waterway licence agreements for its members to cover sun. So the tide, as they say, is definitely turning. We caught up with Paul Hyman of Active360, who runs a sub-school on the River Thames to find out more. Yeah, it's very much a, develop, a developing thing, work in progress. Um, so there is, there's a race community, there's a surf community, and they, there's not a lot of crossover between them. And then you've got this great mass of people that are um, taking the sport up for the first time and on a recreation basis. It's turned now from being a bit odd and a bit sort of freaky to slightly becoming more mainstream. Uh, about 60% of the people starting the sport are women and a constant stream of people coming through. Yeah, it's a very easy sport to get into on flat water because you, you don't have any rescue issues. If you fall off a board, you self-rescue, and we can teach someone to do that in minutes. That's psychologically a really good thing. But the, the advantages of this are the learning curve is so fast that people can get into it very easily. You can uh, learn all the basics quite quickly but then you've got all the all this development that you can do you can, you can get into racing you can get into white water surf so you've got the potential for very high skill levels at the top end but being very accessible at the low end uh, you when you're on the canal system you're at eye level with people walking along the canal so people talk to you more which is nice it's quite social and and uh, you, you see you see more wildlife when you're standing up, you're looking down into birds' nests, for example. You can see how many eggs they've got and you can look in. I know some of the people that have joined and started on SUP have uh, also taken up canoeing. and There'll always be a crossover and that's great. I think, yeah, if we can get people uh, joining in this sport, taking part and then moving into other paddle sports as well and trying different things, brilliant. That's what it's all about, you know, just getting, getting out there. I mean, it's such a, such a lot of fun being on water, whatever you're in, you know, if you're in a boat, a canoe, or on a SUP, it's, you know, it's all fun. And we'll have much more on sub in future editions of The Canoe Show. Racing is the discipline of canoeing where you combine everything, skill, speed, stamina, endurance. Nature is against you all the time and you race against it to be as fast as possible. Of the idea is we go into a rapid with a lot of boat speed. You really want to be on the flow line, that's the fastest route down the river. You can quite easily run, run a line perfectly once and not run it perfectly again the next time you run it. There is a, an element of finesse and speed and strength which will really help you.
When you're out paddling, you probably don't think too much about protecting biodiversity or preventing the spread of invasive species. It's not why you go canoeing, but maybe we all should. Looking after these environments is in our own self-interest, and in Norfolk, the Broads Authority has introduced some innovative measures to make it easy for canoeists to do their bit, as Helen found out on a recent paddling trip. The Norfolk Broads is truly one of Britain's great canoeing destinations. With 200 kilometres of tidal rivers and shallow lakes, there's almost an endless expanse of routes for canoeists of all abilities. But this fantastic resource is under constant threat from both human activity and invasive species. So the challenge for the Broads Authority is to preserve access for all while protecting this delicate environment. Luckily for us, it's a challenge they relish. Well, the Broads is a very sensitive ecosystem. It's got lots of wildlife uh, de uh, designations, both national and international. We see it as a family-friendly destination. What we want to do is to make it the best we possibly can with as many top quality facilities for paddlers so that paddlers actually see this as a top priority destination. If, they, if they're thinking about where am I going to go paddling, the Broads is top of their list. In the lower river system, to, uh, further downstream towards the sea, you have uh, wide reed-fringed reed rivers, massive reed runs, um, and lots and lots of standing windmills or drainage pumps, in fact, that, uh, that, that were used uh, to drain the marshes to make the, the land farmable behind, behind the, the river banks. Uh, so the Broads, one of the iconic images of the Broads is the mills that you see everywhere. Uh, and and it just makes for, for fantastic scenery as you're paddling. You're, you're getting a lot of uh, rare bird species and plant species on the fens and, and open, open uh, areas of land in the broads. So one of the things we're really keen on is to prevent invasive species getting into that fragile ecosystem. And one of the ways that can happen is by people using the water and bringing their boats from elsewhere. Uh, and if you put your boat in and it's got uh, even, uh, not necessarily animal species, but weeds like floating pennywort on it, that can get into the Broads River system and start to become a problem. They could be really tiny animals, like uh, there's a thing called the killer shrimp, which we're, we're really trying to stop the spread of that. Um, uh, so you, you wouldn't necessarily see it when you looked at your boat. The Environment Agency uh, and, and other conservation bodies, including ourselves, are running a program called Check Clean Dry. So you check your gear, uh, clean as far as possible, and let it dry out completely, and you'll, you'll probably kill it. Yeah, so we're building these uh, um, canoe launch points because while, while we're telling people don't launch off natural banks, we actually want to be providing safe facilities and making it easy for people to get into the water and paddle and enjoy the national park uh, area generally. So here we've installed a brush system for people when they push their boat through uh, to get onto the canoe launch. It should hopefully brush off the, uh, any shrimp or other invasive species that's on the bottom of the boat before they put it in the water. We've had really positive feedback on, on all the facilities we've built in the last year. Um, as I say, we, we, we want to expand that because we've also published a range of uh, canoe trails that sort of direct people to the best areas for paddling throughout the broads. And in those areas where the canoe, tra the, the canoe trails cover, we want to get as many good facilities in for launching as possible. For me, as a paddler in the Broads, it enables me to get away from uh, the, the bustle of my, my life. It enables me to get to some really beautiful areas that are quiet and tranquil. And it's really, I suppose, a cure for the soul when you're paddling around this area. It, it feeds you and makes you grow as a person. Having paddled just a small section of the Broads, I can certainly agree with that. And I can't wait to come back and see more of this very special place. The world of canoe freestyle is one of this sport's most dynamic and spectator-friendly disciplines, and it's one that British athletes excel in. But freestyle isn't just about competition, and up and down the country paddlers are pulling tricks just for the sheer fun of it. I wanted to have a go, so I met up with wave sport team athlete Alan Ward at the renowned, and if I'm honest, rather scary, Hurley Weir. So what are the features of Hurley Weir, and what have I got to look forward to then this morning? It's a very friendly weir as weirs go. So uh, we'll just be surfing on the wave, doing some, tr trying to do some sp basic spins and some carving around and 
I guess one of the most important things is uh, remembering that a flat spin is called a flat spin. You don't want to be too hard on your edges, you don't want to be leaning. As soon as you do that you'll be catching the, the green water that runs through underneath the boat and it'll start to pull you off or you'll engage a calf, which is not what you want to do when you're doing a spin. You want to keep your body very upright, very neutral and uh, keep always looking upstream, which is always a good one, and just use your knees just to do very gentle edge changes as you go round through the move. Once I got out on the water and was watching some of the other paddlers, I was struck by how easy they made it look. Then, after a quick briefing from Alan, it was my turn. I didn't even manage to stay on for a few seconds. This was going to be harder than I thought. A bit longer this time, but I was still getting kicked off the back. I needed to figure out what was going wrong. Thankfully, I wasn't the only one struggling, and the best thing to do was just to get back out there. It was beginning to dawn on me that as a slalom athlete, I've always avoided stoppers or power straight through them. So this was all a little counterintuitive for me. Maybe that's why I was struggling so much, but at least I was starting to get some turns going. Alan offered to give me a bit of a demo, and then I would try and copy him. My turn. It was as bad as ever. But then I remembered that Alan did his run in slow motion, so maybe that would help. Wishful thinking. But then, just as I was ready to give up, It may not look that clever, but I can tell you, I was chuffed. And I think that's where we should leave it and let Alan show us all how it's done. River Hamble is one of the most popular rivers on the south coast and a magnet for sailors. The route starts at a public slipway next to Swanwick Marina in Lower Swanwick and travels upstream through the Hampshire countryside all the way to Botany Mill at the river's most northerly navigable tip. The Hamble is a tidal river and the upper reaches are really only viable on a full high tide. The first section is quite a busy stretch of river with numerous moorings and at peak times a lot of boat traffic. You pass first under a road bridge that you probably will have driven over on your way in, then a railway bridge and finally the M27 motorway before you break out into quieter, more natural surroundings. Quite soon, one of the many inlets beckons and although I paddled this trail in winter, there's still plenty of interest. But just in case you need some encouragement, here's what it looks like in late summer. A little further on, you reach the shores of Manor Farm Country Park, and the full scale of the river lies before you. From the other end of this stretch, you get a better idea of the shape of the channel as it snakes up towards Kerbridge. As you reach the end of this stretch, the river bends sharp left, and you see the point where Kerbridge Creek joins the Hamble, and this presents you with two options. I'm paddling on up to Botley, staying on the Hamble, and pretty soon, the river feels very different. The 
further upstream you go, the narrower the river gets, until finally, after following a small channel, you arrive at Botany Mill. There are plenty of places to pull over for a break. And the entertainment's not bad either. It might look as though this is the end of the line, but on spring tides, when the water is really high, this rather inaccessible looking tunnel is just too tempting to pass up. Rather like something out of a C.S. Lewis novel, the handle then delivers you to a pond under a small weir. And having come through the tunnel, it's all a bit like discovering a hidden world at the very top of the river. Back down at the junction with Kerbridge Creek. If you've made good time and there's still enough water, you can paddle up the other side to Kerbridge, where there's a pub with its own pontoon. Well, it'd be rude not to. But if you're concerned about the tide, there's always the Jolly Sailor on the river's edge when you get back to Lower Swanwick. This is a beautiful river, and it really does offer a huge amount of variety and interest in one single trail. One of the best things about canoeing is that it's so easy to just get out on the water. But if you learn some new skills, it can take your enjoyment of the sport to a whole new level. Canoeing is technique based, and simple things like understanding the basic paddle strokes can make a huge difference to your enjoyment of the sport. Canoe clubs are still the best place to learn skills because you're surrounded by other paddlers who will encourage you and share their knowledge. But if you don't want to join a club, then you could choose an activity provider. I've come down to one of hundreds of outdoor activity centres across the country to see what they offer. Kirsty, what are the options for people when they come to get trained? From us, we offer a range of different courses, but probably our starter ones would be something like a Discover or a Learn To. So it's basically an introduction into paddle sports, getting you out in a boat, getting you used to just, you know, basic movements. So you can obviously enjoy being out with the family or being out with friends, obviously, a lot more. They could look at the down the British canoeing route, so the one star, two star kind of you know, the opportunity to progress in their skills, obviously develop further, have a look at different environmental conditions. Or they can go down the recreational route so they can come and hire boats from us and uh, just get out on the river and have fun. So what do people get out of this? I think there's often, sometimes you see people who may have paddled quite a bit and then we'll give them some little snippets of information or a couple of little techniques. You know, they go away and come back the next week and go, oh, I tried what you said. And actually, that's so much easier, you know, and they're the great moments as coaches to see when you've actually said something and someone's taken it on board and it's happened, it's much better. But also I think if they come in with a friend or a family member, obviously they get that bond between them as, as partners for kayaking, so obviously they've then got a kayak buddy or a canoe buddy to go out with. Tell us about some of the most common things you help people with. It's probably a couple. People obviously when they sit in a kayak think it's a bit like their armchair at home, so they start leaning back, their arms drop, so obviously their paddle's quite a low angle. Also, you know, the forwards paddling, but just using their shoulders, so obviously it's not the best technique. They're not getting the most out of each stroke. Those are probably the two main ones that we see. So it doesn't really matter which route you take. All that matters is that you learn, so you can get more out of the sport you love. Well, that's it for this edition of The Canoe Show. We'll see you next time. Goodbye. Goodbye. Show is brought to you in association with British Canoeing.